good afternoon and welcome to the to another special episode on the, from our punarathan uh, convention uh first of all i hope you guys are enjoying and following all the events going on live we have multiple events on multiple platforms around 18 of them with 20 to 30 entries in each one of them and students are actively and intensively uh, competing in all of them uh so i hope uh, we have a lot of viewers coming on this session as well so we believe at nos plan that apart from the competition there should be a part of learning as well and today for uh, another special les lesson we have with us ms suruchi badwal she is from terry uh, she is a, a she is a senior fellow in impacts vulnerability and adaptation uh, and she will be uh, addressing the audience today on a special uh, topic i mean i can talk about it but at the end of the day like i say i am not the a uh, reputed person to be talking about it or the perfect one i might just may end up make saying uh, blabbering about stuff uh so without much ado i would like to welcome ms suruchi on the screen welcome to the show ma'am uh thank you uh, nirvan for giving me this opportunity i'll just be sharing my slides uh give me a second i hope my slides are now visible yes ma'am okay uh so thank you for giving me this opportunity and uh, uh, inviting me to the convention uh, uh the topic of my presentation today is on climate resilience and planning i understand it's a convention that's going on and uh, there are multiple colleges that are participating uh my contribution towards uh, uh climate change and uh, research related to climate change has been more on the scientific side and therefore today i would be presenting some of the scientific facts related to climate change that are known to us and uh, you know the work that we have been doing so far which may help i think many of the students uh, out there uh, in terms of uh, their thought process on how uh, in your planning processes uh, the work that and and the and the uh, you know the uh, subjects that you uh, study you can actually integrate most of the things that you know uh, are being talked about on uh, on the scientific side related to climate and an understanding on the changes uh, in the climate uh, so uh, so just to uh, uh, introduce the uh, uh, the topic uh, i thought this was a very good picture to start with which is basically a picture of the universe uh, uh, and to drive home the fact that we are all part of the universe the system the sun the moon the stars and the earth and as humans we are all concerned about our habitat and our surroundings we are the most advanced form of life on earth human beings to say with the abilities to think and communicate and therefore we would like uh, you know to for, for us to plan for a better world a better home and a better place to live in and with this message in mind we hello uh, sorry to interrupt you uh, i think the presentation slides are not moving can you check that Okay. We are still on the first slide. Can you see the second slide Hi, yes. now? Yeah, I think it's a problem with the slide sharing mode. So I'm going to not be on slideshow mode, uh, and maybe I'll move ahead in this manner. Uh, okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, so I was just saying that uh, this quote that I just put down, uh, you know, to start with, basically saying we are part of the universe, the system, the sun, stars, moon, and earth, and as humans, we are concerned about our habitat and our surroundings. we the most advanced form of life on earth as human beings and we have the ability to think and communicate and therefore you know uh, as humans we would like uh, to plan for a better world a better home and a better place to live in and that's the key message for all planners decision makers uh, uh, you know uh, people who are basically uh, thinking about moving into planning as a career ahead and with that we enter into the concept of climate change uh, uh, basically it's very important when we talk about climate change to understand what are we talking about and it's not about daily 
uh, uh, weather that we observe. Of course, uh, the climate is about the weather, but it's about the weather over a longer period of time. So, uh, so scientifically speaking, when we talk about what is the climate of a particular uh, place, region, etc., we look at, look at it over a thirty-year time frame. So, basically, a longer period of time on which we basically uh, average, uh, you know, basic weather variables to talk about how the climate of a particular region is, and therefore, some average of weather conditions over a thirty-year time period gives us the uh, the climate of a particular region, and that's. And any change in that climate over a period of time is basically being referred to as change in the climate, and how that is likely to basically, uh, you know, change over time. Uh, it's an integrated system that we are talking about, where it's just so the climate system consists of the terrestrial surfaces. It con consists of the uh, uh, it consists of the atmosphere. It consists of the hydrosphere. And all these systems are interconnected with each other. They are not isolated. They function and uh, basically connect with each other in one or the other form of physical processes uh, that are observed. Uh, uh, and, and therefore, one system influences the other. So any change in one of the systems, say, for example, if there are changes in ocean systems, if there are changes in river systems that we have, that will have an effect on uh, terrestrial systems that will have an effect on atmospheric systems as well. So the entire system is an integrated system and therefore it's an interconnected system and any change in one of the system basically influences change in the other system. This is basically uh, driving home the same fact. And of course, these changes are not of a linear uh, uh, context that you know, one, you know, one unit of change in uh, X uh, uh, condition will lead to Y unit of change in y, you know in uh, conditions in the other system. Uh, so these are all non-linear uh, changes and you know interactions uh, that are uh, basically occurring, and therefore we do not know uh, any quantum of change in one of the systems may lead to drastic changes in other systems, and it may not be X is equal to Y and X if X increases Y increases. So they are all nonlinear uh, interactions happening, and of course, changes in one basically may lead to drastic changes in in the other. They all we in India we are based in the tropics. Uh, we are a, 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 a you know surplus uh, uh, nation in terms of receiving sunshine, solar radiation. Uh, we we know how the Earth is structured. Uh, the temperate and the polar regions are cooler compared to the tropical regions. Uh, uh, so so the so there are certain uh, regions uh, you know in on Earth's surface which are cooler compared to the others. And uh, there's an obvious reason reason for that because of direct radiation and you know uh, uh, you know uh, indirect radiation that is falling in certain parts of the Earth's surface and therefore there are surplus areas of radiations and there are deficit areas of radiation that we observe on Earth's surface. And we right we basically lie in the surplus zone. Normally, uh, the atmosphere is composed uh, of uh, uh, these gases. Uh, nitrogen, oxygen uh, constitute the majority of uh, the composition. Uh, uh, there are other types of rare gases uh, uh, which are of uh, in a minority. And most of the uh, other gases, uh, basically, that we are referring to include greenhouse gases, which are also naturally uh, present in some of these greenhouse gases are also naturally present in the atmosphere, like carbon dioxide has been there, uh, but in a small fraction, water vapor content has been there, methane has been there, nitrous oxide. And uh, so some of the gases were already there in a, you know, in a, uh, in a normal uh, uh, composition uh, situation condition of the atmosphere. Uh, but however, uh, with the increase in the greenhouse gas concentrations, uh, there has been a greenhouse effect over time since the pre-industrial era. And what we now observe is that the outgoing solar radiation uh, is getting trapped by these greenhouse gases and it's being re-radiated back to the Earth's surface, which is warming the Earth's surface and therefore causing changes in the entire climate system. So all our terrestrial surfaces, our uh, water surfaces, and the atmosphere itself, which is getting uh, warmed up. Uh, and therefore, with this warming, our multiple changes, everything under the sun is actually likely to change. Uh, your rainfall patterns are likely to change. 
humidity levels are going to change. So there's a whole lot of change that we are bringing on to the Earth system with these changes that we're talking about. This is basically to say there's a normal condition in which the Earth used to exist where you had greenhouse gases present uh, along with you know, nitrogen and oxygen, which were the major gases present in the atmosphere. The abnormal condition that we've created because of uh, 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 industrialization processes and land use land cover change that has happened at a very rapid pace since the pre-industrial era, uh, which has basically contributed to the greenhouse effect and basically warmed up the Earth's surface constantly. And of course, it's still continuing. Uh, this is something we've already touched on. I'm going to move on to uh, this. This is this is from the uh, uh, you know the famous Algo presentation, a slide taken from his schema, uh, which basically says uh, why are we why are these changes happening since the industrial era, and uh, uh, and uh, are we confident about the changes and you know the contributions uh, uh, due to human causes in terms of increase in concentrations of greenhouse gas, and we're pretty confident about the contributions. Uh, due to development uh, uh, over the last 100, 150 years that has led to the increase in the greenhouse gas concentrations. The blue line basically tells you about the natural variability in the climate. So the climate was always changing. It, it has never been uh, constant or stagnant. Uh, if you look at it over centuries and millennia, the Earth's climate has always been changing. There are glacial periods, there are interglacial periods, and they run over centuries and millennia. But what is very unusual that we observe over the millennia and centuries of climate that Earth has experienced is that there's suddenly a, a, a very steep increase that we observe in the graph, which has never been observed over centuries and millennia. And therefore, scientists were forced to basically look at the causes behind this increase, which basically shows that there are anthropogenic reasons which are very strong enough, which has influenced the change in the uh, in the composition of the Earth's atmosphere, which is leading to the changes in the climate. The green line is basically saying we are pretty confident it is humans which have caused these changes in the Earth's atmosphere. It's out of way of the natural variability that Earth used to experience over centuries and millennia prior to the industrial era. And therefore, there's something that we are doing which is not correct, which is basically affecting the Earth, Earth system. And of course, if the Earth system get, gets affected, we, all of us are likely to get affected living on, the, uh, living on Earth. Uh, these are the various sources that we normally talk about uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, human uh, causes of uh, contributing to greenhouse gases. It's basically, uh, uh, you know, uh, the uh, industrial processes uh, which have released a lot of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. It's basically consumption of energy in various forms, whether it's transportation, electricity production, it's industry consuming energy. Or, uh, or the other uh, uh, consumptive uh, uses. Uh, it's land use, land cover change. When you're shifting from a, a forest to uh, you know, uh, an agriculture uh, uh, form of land use or a built up area form of land use, you're basically converting land, which is a sink of carbon to a source of carbon. And, and therefore, you are leading to emissions of greenhouse gases, uh, net emissions of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. And therefore, land use land cover change also has a big contribution to uh, uh, to increase in the concentrations of these gases in the atmosphere. Uh, burning of forest, uh, you know, emissions from uh, waste, the waste sector, uh, uh, and and from agriculture. So, so there are many sources which are basically contributing to the increase in the concentration of gases in the atmosphere. There are counter effects uh, through particulate matter. Uh, of course, particulate matter is not good for you know for health because of air pollution increase. Uh, but it does create if there is large amount of pollution, particulate matter in a particular location, it, it does create a counter effect of cooling to the warming that is experienced. But it's very localized. And it's for a short period of time of two to three days because the particulate matter doesn't has a very short lifetime compared to the greenhouse gases, which has a lifetime of you know many of the gases have a lifetime of more than 100 and 100 plus years. Uh, uh, also, volcanic eruptions basically throw out a lot of particulate matter into the atmosphere, which lead to a net cooling effect. And whenever we have these large volcanoes that erupt in different parts of the world, we do experience a 
you know a little bit of cooling for a period of time and when you see the data you will see a, a snag over there basically showing how first it had been increasing but of course because of a volcano you know the earth has cooled a bit it, it, the temperatures fall down a bit but but if you look at the trend over a longer period of time the net trend effect is an increase in the warming over earth surface of course i've talked about land use land use change and forestry and how different forms of land use and land use change contribute to emissions and greenhouse gas concept we're pretty confident as scientists in terms of changes in the climate that are happening we've already observed uh, 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 changes in the climate in the 20th century. This is from the IPCC report and its findings, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which basically talks about how global mean temperature has risen above Earth's average mean global temperatures by 0.7 degrees centigrade uh, over the uh, over and above the industrial era. Uh, similarly, snow cover and ice extent has reduced considerably all over the world. Arctic and Antarctic ice sheets are already melting, and you must have come across. Uh, uh, many news uh, pieces which basically talk about uh, how uh, the Antarctic ice sheets have been melting considerably and, and there has been significant impact in the Arctic region. Global sea, re sea levels as a result have increased because of the melting of large ice sheets and glaciers and, and expansion of the oceans because of warming and, 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 and therefore, you know, we are also observing, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, risk to coastal areas. Uh, so, so what what is being predicted for the twenty first century? There are model models that are basically used to basically arrive at uh, uh, you know uh, arrive at uh, findings, which basically uh, indicate in the direction in which the Earth is likely to warm up further, and the changes that we are talking about likely to continue in the future. Uh, 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 the IPCC basically talks about how temperatures are in the 21st century likely to increase and the range of increase is basically given between a 1.1 to 6.4 degrees centigrade by the end of the 21st century. Similarly, corresponding to it, we will be seeing rise in sea levels by a certain margin and, and the decline in snow cover and sea ice extent is going to continue because the earth is still warming and we have not put a stop to it. This is basically to show that there are, you know, different directions in which basically we can, you know, we are talking about the future. The future cannot be foretold, you know, uh, uh, you know exactly. So therefore, there are different uh, assumptions that uh, which the models uh, take into account on the basis of which they predict how the future may unfold. And therefore, uh, uh, so one of the trajectories, which is the blue line, is basically to say we will move towards a cleaner, greener, cleaner path. Uh, 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 you know, which is uh, where we are basically emitting very less into the atmosphere and we are containing our greenhouse gas emissions and containing its concentrations in the atmosphere. Therefore, we may basically perturb the Earth system to a lesser degree, which is the blue line. But if we continue on the red path, which is basically a fossil fuel intensive world where we continue to emit greenhouse gases into the atmosphere and the land use land cover change processes continue at a rapid pace, etc., then the contributions are going to be far more higher and the changes are going to be far more higher. And, and of course, with the changes in the temperatures, it's just not about a change in a particular parameter. The changes in temperature will lead to changes in rainfall patterns, in evapotranspiration rates, in humidity levels, and increase in the frequency and intensity of extreme events like droughts, floods, cyclones, tornadoes, typhoons, etc. This is basically to say that, uh, you know, these, so, so the lower, the lower, uh, uh, you know, pathway, which is the cleaner pathway versus the uh, versus the dirtier pathway. So the, this is the, uh, uh, you know, these are two scenarios, uh, far end of the spectrum. There are four scenarios that are normally studied, which you basically have as the bars over here. Uh, but uh, most of the studies pick up the uh, two extremes of the spectrum and basically look at how the world is going to change with regard to these two extremes. Right now, we are on the trajectory of the red pathway. This is basically looking at those two uh, scenarios uh, in terms of temperatures. You see in the extreme scenario, the dirtier world, the rate of change is going to be far more higher. Uh, uh, if we basically follow a cleaner path moving towards renewables, uh, uh, you know, uh, being very conscious about our land use, land cover change, et cetera, and the form in which basically we are converting, uh, uh, we may be on a trajectory where the rate of change is likely to be lesser. Similarly, changes in precipitation patterns across the four scenarios being presented 
just to uh, drive home the fact for India, basically it's going to be a more warmer and a wetter world for us. So we are expecting that there will be more rainfall in future time periods over the Indian subcontinent. Of course, we do not know where the rain is going to fall. It's just like the monsoons, the distribution pattern is very skewed uh, and, uh, and one cannot exactly predict where the rainfall is going to uh, basically uh, fall in uh, uh, how much quantums. Uh, similarly, uh, it's very unclear uh, in what form this excess rain is going to be, uh, you know, uh, be falling. Uh, uh, whether it's going to lead to more uh, uh, rainfall in already heavy rainfall uh, areas and zones, which may basically lead to more flood-like situations. Is it going to clog our cities uh, because uh, you know of uh, water longing conditions that may get created? And Mumbai is basically already experiencing that. So the examples in our own country where you know one of our metropolitan cities is experiencing floods and water longing year after year, and there are predictions already for them. Uh, you know, from the climate models that, you know, they may, they will be experiencing more and more rain. So they have to be much more prepared uh, uh, and better prepared uh, for the, uh, for the, you know, next many decades in terms of being able to handle more water. Uh, similarly, there may be areas that may receive less water and therefore drought-like conditions that are likely to get created. And therefore, one needs to look at corrective measures to be able to address concerns in those regions as well. Of course, this is related to coastal areas, saying that coastal areas are going to experience a rise in sea level. There are different causes of rise in the sea level is the melting of the large ice sheets in Arctic and Antarctic, but also melting of the glaciers, where ultimately the rivers take the water back into the seas and the oceans. And, and the third phenomenon, which is affecting the rise in the sea levels, is a thermal expansion with rise in temperature does water expand, and therefore the oceans and the seas are expanding. This is basically the extent to which sea level is like to, likely to rise under different scenarios. And of course, with as you move towards the extreme scenario, the conditions worsen. Uh, I'm just going to skip the slide. And, and, and now I have a few set of slides which basically show examples of changes that we've already observed across the world. In terms of changes, this is basically Lake Chad in Africa, which has disappeared completely when you look at it from 1960s to 2001 onwards. Uh, uh, there is a strong contribution of uh, of changes in the climate in the region, which has contributed to this decline, uh, which is which is which has basically been studied by uh, the scientists out there. Of course, glaciers. There's a very clear signal of the impact uh, climate change is having on glaciers, where we basically observing decline in snow levels and glacial ice content in many parts of the world, including our own part of the world, where Gangotri. You know, one of the glaciers which is mostly talked about is the Gangotri Glacier because one of our largest catchments of perennial rivers dependent uh, uh, on uh, flows during the rain season from that particular glacier. So similarly, this is an example of Kilimanjaro in terms of showing how the snow ice content has reduced considerably. And if you see how rapidly the graph shows the decline has happened. This is an, a picture of the Gangotri Glacier from the from uh, a NASA satellite imagery, which talks about where the glacial snout was in 1780 and how in 2001 this has basically declined, uh, and of course it has further declined over the over the decades that have passed. Uh, um, now all these changes that I'm talking about: increase in forest fires, coral bleaching in coastal areas, which impacts fisheries, desertification processes that have changed across the world floods and landslides that are being observed in different parts of the world. And then, of course, the ice sheets are melting. Uh, uh, there are, all these changes have an impact on life on Earth. Uh, so, uh, so whether it is human beings or other biodiversity that we are talking about, this is an example of the pine beetle, uh, basically, whose population is increasing because of a warming climate. And, and with the increase in their population, uh, uh, there's a conclusion by scientists that, you know, there is, it is killing more trees because it feeds on trees and, uh, and logs. And therefore, its, uh, it's population is increasing and therefore it's been feeding on more trees and logs in a particular region in the U.S. And, and, and therefore, it's been damaging forests and woodland areas. In, in, in the United States. It's an example from the United States. But just to basically drive home the fact, uh, uh, we also have similar kind of pests 
you know, uh, thriving because of conducive environments getting created for their spread. And what we've been observing is that they have been increasing, you know, uh, uh, with a warming climate, and therefore they would impact our uh, our uh, resources as well, and and therefore indirectly affect us as well in terms of availability of resources. So, uh, so, uh, so it's it's likely that you know we may not have the pine beetles here, uh, you know, uh, having an impact, but there may be some other pest. Uh, or type of pests that may have an effect. Of course, I talked about how the extremes are increasing droughts and floods and cyclones in coastal areas. All of these things that we're talking about, changes in the climate, have impacts on human life and it and uh, its development. So, uh, so the impacts are normally studied across sectors. How is agriculture going to be affected? How are water resources going to get affected? Coastal regions being affected? forests and biodiversity being affected and how is health going to be affected? And right now we're in the COVID situation. Uh, we all understand how complex it has been to deal with it. And of course, with climate change, there is a, a certain kind of a conclusion that the spread of infectious diseases is likely to increase in future time periods. What kind of infrastructure do we have to support such kind of uh, risks in the future is something we need to basically plan about. So, so impacts are basically studied then across different sectors. Given the climate is going to change, everything under, under the sun is going to change. How do we become more prepared for it? I've already told you this, that India is going to be more warmer and it's going to be more wetter. And these are the different sectors for which basically uh, studies are done. Uh, so agriculture is basically being uh, the, the direction in which agriculture is likely to get affected, at least in India, to let you know. We're basically expecting that cro our crops are going to get affected because of various reasons, whether it's temperature sensitivity or it's because of CO2 increases, et cetera, or it's because of water scarcity or because of droughts and floods or indirect effects of increase in pests that I was talking about and diseases that may affect production levels. Now we are a self-sustained country in terms of food production. India prides itself in saying after the Green Revolution, it has been able to feed its population. In fact, we export a lot of food right now to the world. Now, uh, now with climate change, uh, what is being expected by scientists is that the production levels are going to fall, our yields are going to fall, and of course, it's already falling. It's stagnated in many parts of the country. Uh, um, you know, uh, we may see a decline in production of certain kind of crops. Uh, this is an example of study done by the Indian Agricultural Research Institute talking about how rice, wheat, and mustard uh, growth of rice, wheat, and mustard across the country is likely to fall uh, because of sensitivities to increases in temperatures and changes in uh, uh, precipitation patterns. Uh, they are measures that one can take to basically counter these effects where you have to basically you know, identify what kind of measures can be uh, taken up to counter the effects. Uh, the, the most uh, uh, you know, common uh, method is uh, by scientists, agriculture scientists, is to basically look at new varieties which are adapted to new conditions. And therefore, that requires a lot of research, scientific research, before a new variety can be introduced to the market and, and by the time it reaches our farmers. So, 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 of course, people are working on it. There are different sets of people working on different parts of the solution space. Uh, to see how we can counter the effects. Now, on water resources, of course, where it's going to become less uh, rainfall, there's there are going to be uh, conditions of water scarcity, water availability may be a concern in some of the dry regions, flood-like situations may be a, a you know, concern in some of the wetter regions. So therefore, water is definitely, water resources likely to be affected. It may affect the quality of the water as well. This is a picture of the Indo-Gangetic plains. Uh, so it's the Indus River, the Ganga catchment, and the Brahmaputra catchment uh, uh, in the subcontinent, basically saying how temperatures are likely to change in that region. And of course, rainfall patterns are likely to change, where it's going to become far more wetter. Therefore, we are ex expecting more extremes. We are expecting more floods, flash floods, like situations in this uh, region. And therefore, we need to plan for these changes that uh, are, are, are being expected. And these changes are not in the next 100 years. It's These are in the next 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. So it's all, we are living in it, actually. We are living in the change. 
and therefore we need to start planning now in whatever we do in uh, you know in terms of development we need to integrate these concerns in that developmental planning to be to be able to build our resilience towards uh, uh, towards these changes that we are talking about which may affect our lives as we move forward of course the return period of floods the assessments done for that to see and how a return period of flood which was a one in a 10 year flood is likely to become a one in a five year flood etc and and therefore the frequencies are basically changing and therefore we need to be far more prepared than we were before so that it requires more investment it requires more planning coastal regions of course uh, there it's not about one sector studying one sector or the other but in coastal areas the there's an added on risk of sea level rise cyclones typhoons etc therefore one needs to study all of it in context in terms of looking at how fisheries is affected how settlements people living there are affected how agriculture is affected water resources affected how infrastructure is likely to get damaged tourism getting affected human health basically getting affected so so it's a whole package of sorts in terms of looking at how the risks are likely to spread in coastal areas there are direct implications to livelihoods in terms of catch potential changes so agriculture definitely direct implications and livel livelihoods but also in case of fisheries there are likely to be changes in the catch potential of fish fishes in the oceans uh, because of a warming ocean there's ocean acidification happening because of increase in carbon dioxide concentration and it may also basically lead to certain kind of effects in terms of availability of uh, uh, of uh, marine uh, uh, you know uh, marine uh, resources uh, and and therefore there are indirect implications on people uh, there are simulations that are done to understand. Uh, so these are storm surge simulations. This is a study done by Terry for the coastal area of West Bengal, which is a Sundarbans area. We're trying to see different, uh, uh, you know, scenarios of sea level rise to see how much land in the Sundarbans area and it's, you know, the uh, the West Bengal coastal region is likely to get affected. Uh, a 0.59 meter sea level rise above a IPCC scenario, one meter and a four meter uh, scenario of rise in sea level, basically saying how land is going to get inundated in the coastal Sundarbans deltaic region, and and therefore you know an understanding of the risk itself to start with allows for better planning for resilience. Uh, uh, so that, you know, when you basically are planning any development activity, you take into account that risk that is posed because the, of the changes in the climate that are being portrayed so that, uh, so that any infrastructure that is being planned, built, et cetera, you know, is built with, uh, with resilience, you know, keeping resilience in mind and, uh, and, uh, and is, uh, basically, uh, you know, uh, built in a manner where the levels of uh, risk are uh, reduced uh, reduced so uh, so so these assessments normally help you with all that kind of uh, planning uh, this is basically talking about arabian sea and bay of bengal cyclone occurrences and and changes in the future which basically say uh, drive home the fact that the frequencies of these events in in india basically both on the eastern coast and the western coast are not likely to increase, but of course the intensities of these incidences are likely to increase. So what I mean, basically mean is that a depression is going to change into a deep depression. A deep depression may come in the form of a cyclonic storm and when it hits uh, the land, a cyclonic storm as a severe cyclonic storm and a severe cyclonic storm will take the shape of a very severe cyclonic storm. So we are basically being, uh, uh, exposed to more extreme forms of events, um, though maybe the frequencies of at least cyclones, both on the eastern and the western coast, are not likely to change when compared to the last 100 years. This is basically to talk about how heat wave conditions have been changing in the country, temperatures have been, so it's, it's, so we are already into it, as I said, temperatures have been warming, heat wave conditions have been rising. Uh, they, since 2003 onwards, there's been reporting about deaths due to heat waves across the world, whether it's you know France, whether it's other part, parts of the world, including other countries in Europe. Uh, India has also been experiencing the same. We have already high temperatures. Any degree of increase in temperatures further 
uh, than what we already experienced has been creating havoc in many parts of the country. There have been deaths reported from uh, many parts, uh, Andhra Pradesh to start with, Orissa, uh, you know, Rajasthan, Uttar Pradesh, Punjab, etc. We have been experiencing increase in death rates because of heat, heat wave conditions getting created. Uh, this is basically to say how vulnerability assessments have been carried out. This is just for the agricultural sector, saying that at the district level, how different parts of the country are highly vulnerable to these changes that we're talking about. I'm just going to skip these few slides. Uh, uh, health, I've already told. Of course, I talked about infectious diseases. I talked about heat waves. The other types of health impacts that we're basically expecting is related to spread of vector-borne diseases. And this is largely to talk about malaria, dengue, chikungunya, like diseases which are spread through mosquitoes. Uh, why is it linked to climate? It's because, uh, uh, you know, these vectors are uh, adapted to certain weather conditions. And with a warming climate and a, a, a comparatively higher humid, you know, climate, uh, the spread of these vectors, it is expected, is likely to increase. So the transmission windows, the expansion and it, the spread of these vectors is likely to increase. Therefore, you know, it is now being told by scientists, it's being predicted by scientists that regions which never used to see mosquitoes before because of colder temperatures and maybe uh, controlled humidity levels are likely to now find, uh, you know, uh, you know, find these vectors prevalent in those regions as well. And of course, so the, there's expansion of territory of these vectors. There's also expansion of transmission windows. So if they were existing for a period of four months or six months, you know, uh, and suddenly, you know, you had different kind of a temperature or, you know, uh, weather condition, you know, you like, for example, in Delhi, you know, you don't see the mosquitoes during extreme periods of winter because of non-conduciveness of the weather conditions for uh, their existence. Now, if the temperatures are warming and it were to be a warmer winter, etc., we may we may likely observe uh, mosquitoes, uh, you know, being present 12 months a year, so all throughout the year. So the transmission windows are increasing across regions, the expansion to regions where they never used to exist, and of course, the spread of these diseases and the risk of uh, contracting these diseases far more exceeds. Uh, uh, and then, of course, waterborne and water related diseases. These are some studies basically done to do the assessments with the various kind of data sets that we basically use. These are examples from studies done by Perry uh, for the state of Maharashtra and looking at spread of malaria, uh, looking at heat wave conditions basically getting created. And of course, this is a heat and discomfort, discomfort index created by a Western country. This is uh, uh, for the European region where they're looking at how different types of temperatures and humidity concentrations create conditions of discomfort for human beings. Uh, uh, and this is highly European in context. I would say we would need to develop our own scales like this to be able to talk about heat and discomfort for the Indian subcontinent, because if you see the highest temperature over here is going to 42 degrees centigrade. Now, 42 degree in India in summers, many of our regions already cross 45 and 46. So we need our own index of discomfort. Uh, maybe we are tall. We are humans living, you know, in India. We we are used to tolerating higher degrees of temperature. So we different. We need a different scale of discomfort developed. Because uh, uh, because normally uh, also living in certain conditions you you basically uh, adjust to those conditions and you adapt to those conditions and your body is well suited to uh, uh, to those conditions so so for example for a European coming and living here in 45 degrees centigrade it may be much more difficult but for us living in you know in India where we've been experiencing such temperatures it may not be that drastic a change. But of course, any change from what we are used to over and above may be an extreme for us as well. And that is what we are talking about may affect us. I'm going to skip this slide. Uh, uh, there are huge unknowns we are talking about when we talk about climate change. And when you do get to hear about climate skeptics saying that, you know, how do we know what should we plan against? Because, you know, we are talking about the future. It's like astrology or, you know, or numerology where somebody is predicting something to you in terms of numbers or in terms of, you know, somebody's looking at your hand and saying how your your future may be. 
and that's how you know the models are like you know they're taking into account some assumptions and they're telling you how the future may be and we don't know in what direction the future may unfold so you may you know the world may decide to go for a greener path so you may be on the lower end of the spectrum the world may go for a you know dirtier path and they, you may be on the higher end of the spectrum so what do you plan against do you plan against the higher end of the spectrum or at the lower end of the spectrum because planning needs in planning planning needs investment and therefore uh, if we talk about planning against these changes you may have we are talking about resources being invested and therefore nobody is interested in basically investing extra resources until they are very sure and i'm talking about policy makers and decision makers they need accurate answers to certain questions to be able to put their money in certain places and because it's all about money and investment uh, for infrastructure for development so it's very difficult to answer that question and we agree as scientists it's very difficult it's not going to be easy to answer that we are very sure right now we are on the higher end of you know on the dirtier path and we are on this higher end of the trajectory it may be that tomorrow the world decides on something and we may lie somewhere lower end of the spectrum but we don't know about it right so and we are and every year we are observing how the decisions of countries are being taken uh, to be able to see uh, which direction it is pushing us in which uh, you know end of the spectrum are we getting pushed right now we are here and we are pretty sure about it so uh, so ideally uh, uh, you know the only answer that scientists can basically give is that look we uh, we for these very reasons that we don't know how the future may unfold we cannot delay response because the consequences of these changes are going to be quite drastic on human race and therefore you need to plan for these changes now you cannot be waiting to see you know uh, for the next 30 years to see how things are going to change and then basically start planning because because many of the things need to be planned today to be able to have a better future for the next 50 80 100 years that we are talking about and therefore uh, uh, the only best answer that we can provide today is maybe you don't plan for the lower end of the spectrum or the higher end of the spectrum but plan for the best estimate scenario which is the mid estimate uh, scenario which basically talks about the middle level path in terms of change uh, that may occur of course it means if you are on the lower spectrum you're investing more if you're on the higher spectrum in terms of change you're investing less in terms of planning so even if we decide that we will contain uh, the concentration levels and the emissions of greenhouse gases today they are likely to still contribute to changes in the earth system for the next 100 150 years centuries and millennia because the lifetime as i said earlier of these gases are already you know 100 years 150 years it's carbon dioxide has a lifetime in the atmosphere one unit of carbon dioxide released today stays in the atmosphere for 100 150 years so you already perturbed the atmosphere for 150 years methane stays for 12 years nitrous oxide stays for 100 110 years uh, many of the hydrochlorofluorocarbons stay for uh, a matter of few years to thousands of years so you've perturbed the system with those emissions if you've contributed to them today and maybe in the many you know years uh, you know uh, than before uh, you know uh, since the industrial era and now Uh, you've already basically contributed you've already loaded the atmosphere with the concentration of those gases and therefore you are, you are already in for a change as humans for the next hundreds of years uh, but if you want to save the earth surface from drastic change and extinction and and there's the extreme of it is mass extinction of species and there are, there are some people who also talk about this may be the extinction uh, uh, you know the, this may be the cause for extinction of the human species from earth surface so uh, so that's a very drastic view of how the climate the changes in the climate may basically lead to extinction of species we are already contributing to extinction of species uh, uh, you know uh, which we don't even have an account of you know uh, in the forest in the you know the both wildlife and uh, uh, and plant species and and it may take centuries for uh, humans to get affected because as i said we have the capability of thinking and communicating and planning for ourselves uh, uh, but but uh, but if we continue on the same trajectory and we don't do something about this today even if we think we've put up the system for the next hundreds of 
years and centuries i think we are we are talking about extremes of extinction of the human race as well so uh, so 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 it's very important to keep these time scales in mind and basically uh, think about uh, contributing to a world which is sustainable in nature which is uh, which is on a trajectory where we consume less where we follow a greener path where we uh, we we basically make sure that we are not perturbing the system and not changing the system from its natural condition that it used to exist and therefore we need to plan for a world which is much more uh, safer and uh, and uh, you know uh, safer for us to live in so this is basically a link uh, of how climate change impacts systems uh, and and of course uh, it's all linked to the development parts and the planning that we do whether it's related to the economic growth decisions we take or technology de development and deployment or demographics or governance related to each of these and of course all of this also leads to you know our decisions basically frame how the world is going to basically shape itself in future there are solutions that we talk about the terminology we use is adaptation that we can reduce the levels of risk but actually adaptation is not a solution to everything in many cases we may not be able to reduce the risk uh, entirely and therefore there are conditions of ir irreversibility we talk about uh, of course adaptation can be done we can reduce the risk there but in certain systems where we've already damaged the system to a certain extent we can't bring it back to its original form we have you caused irreversible damages uh, uh, and the, and we basically say thresholds have been exceeded tipping points is basically we've tipped the system beyond its natural conditions and we cannot bring it back to its natural conditions so so that there are huge, huge changes and of course there is a there is a solution space that we explore which is looking at mitigation reducing the greenhouse gases concentrations and on the other hand reducing the effects to the impacts of climate change these changes that we are talking about in the climate because as i told you we are already in for a change for the next hundreds of years so we do have to adapt to these changes and of course all our planning has to curtail towards both mitigation supporting mitigation and adaptation to climate change the strong linkages of what we are talking about to sdgs the 17 sdg goals that have been outlaid and 2030s is the time frame when they you know, there will be an accounting process that will be started on how we achieving on these parameters uh, both adaptation mitigation have uh, to climate change have strong linkages with the sdgs so we we do understand that they dev, dev, our development goals and our goals for addressing climate risks uh go hand in hand and therefore uh, what we need to do is basically plan better uh, on each of these uh, parameters to be able to have a safer world to live in uh, in conclusion i would basically say that uh, there are certain it's not that we are basically looking for new responses in every case there are certain things that may be working well and we need to study them and and understand whether they uh, you know uh, the they could be enhanced to basically create the effect that we want in terms of uh, you know moving towards a sustainable world uh, and in certain cases maybe we do not have the right kind of initiatives and that that is where we need to be more innovative and creative and look at what new things new what new things can be basically introduced that may help and reduce the risks and and basically make it a safer world with that i would like to end my presentation and if there are any questions uh, uh, i would be more than happy to take them uh thank you so much for the information ma'am the i mean you've given us so much things to uh, think about for the future uh, and we have a lot of students uh, asking us multiple questions that uh, I'll give my phone to uh, we we uh, we uh, we are pointing out questions from specific people uh, because we are limited by time. Uh, uh, so we have some uh, a question asking how can we be related to the field for another thing, uh, which means researchers or uh, re, uh, like coming back from the great uh, year as a result of the pandemic. So same way, is there anything that can directly be related to the thing? 
So, so my, uh, you know, my whole thinking is you guys are future planners of the world, right? So today you all are studying in the School of Planning and Architecture. You are going to be basically be out there tomorrow following career paths where you will be involved in some space or the other planning for certain kind of development, you know, related to the institute or entity that you're working for, right? And that is where you need to bring in this knowledge, uh, you know, to integrate it in your planning processes. Uh, uh, in the implementation processes that you go forward with, you know, uh, basically you cannot be ignorant to other forms of research and science that are around, which which have an effect on you and other uh, life on earth. So you need to take these concerns into account in your planning processes when you start your career paths and you're working with any entity, maybe a builder, maybe you are, uh, you know, with an architect uh, company. Okay. Yeah, an architect unit. So, so, so the, these learnings, uh, understanding the uh, science uh, uh, of it, is is very important for every uh, planner and decision maker. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. I think that answers the question. Uh, okay, so we have another one from Anirudh Gray from SP Delhi. He's asking, given the discoveries about clean energy technologies being more GHG intensive than conventional ones, which pathway should we take a life cycle related one or momentarily leaving? No, I, I would basically uh, say if you are looking at contributions uh, to sustainability in the long run, you have to look at the life cycle. Uh, you know, analysis to see the entire, uh, you know, uh, you know, effect of a particular uh, technology that is being uh, implemented. So, so, so it would be good to go for life cycle assessments uh, and see the uh, contributions uh, and the net effect of the technology that is being implemented. Uh, I think, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, I hope Anirudh, your question is answered. Uh, so, we have another one from a student from Delhi. He's asking what, according to you, are the most important and immediate planning interventions that are required with climate change? So I'll just take an example of one of the impacts that I was talking about, heat wave conditions, right? Right now in India, because of heat wave conditions being created, uh, the med department, uh, uh, you know, uh, I think it's not very late, it's just last two to three years back, they started, uh, you know, uh, uh, providing advisories to about 100 cities in the country on uh, temperature conditions which are exceeding the normals in those regions right so so there's a process that is initiated because of the conditions that are getting created now if we would have had better planned cities this this would not have been a drastic risk for cities we we don't have planned cities let's be very honest about it you know, most of our cities have just mushroomed up you know and, and most of our spaces have just been you know uh, encroached upon so uh, we lack green spaces. We don't have the proper kind of landscaping in our cities that is needed. Uh, we never planned for them. Now, the, what we've observed through our research is when you have more green spaces uh, and more circulation of air that happens in certain spaces, then the temperatures normally fall down in the region. So within a city also, when you have structures being built up and you have open spaces and green spaces, and when you move from the country spaces to the green spaces, there is a fall in the temperatures that you, you basically observe. Even I think you must have heard that the Pusa, uh, you know, campus that we have in Delhi, which is near Karol Bagh, it basically basically serves as and the ridge area of Delhi. They serve as the lungs of the city. Okay, and uh, uh, so wherever you have green spaces and proper landscaping, if you've done that, you basically provide for more room for circulation and basically controlling these conditions. And right now, if you see how Delhi has developed, and maybe many of our cities are in that form, we do not have those solutions. And we have not even implemented them, or we're not even thinking about it, you know, because of the kind of population we have and demographics we have, it's, maybe it's also difficult, but that doesn't mean that then, you know, you don't plan. So, so there's tremendous scope for planning, for reducing the net effects of the risks that we're talking about. Uh, 
thank you so much ma'am i think that's yeah, like the most appropriate way to answer the specific question uh, but uh, we are a little bit limited by time but i'll try to take up as much questions as we can we have a student from sp bhopal asking what micro level implementations can be done at personal level or at our personal uh, levels okay so when we talk about uh, reducing greenhouse gas levels actually at the personal level it's to start with something that we all hear about all the time actually if you don't require uh, you know electricity in a particular room etc please switch off your lights your fans consume less because if you consume less uh, you know the the net production of energy which is contributing to the release of greenhouse gases may uh, may basically be less utilized and therefore your contributions to the concentration of greenhouse gases will fall down uh, it's not only about electricity consumption it's also about uh, transportation so use using public modes of transportation using uh, uh, modes where you're pooling up uh, you know car pooling etc and uh, traveling uh, where you are not a single contributor to the emissions but basically you know you're 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 having a combined effect even if you're emitting i'm not saying don't travel because that cannot happen in today's world uh, you know people need to move and people need to basically uh, live a life so but but plan for ways which may allow for a lesser carbon foot, foot footprint uh, you know at least at a personal level your footprint should be less which of course i'm not saying it's going to change the whole situation of the world but every person if you know thinks in that manner may be able to create a larger effect in terms of the footprint we are able to create and therefore we have to make that footprint much much larger to our personal uh, effects that we can basically uh, create and it's also to do with saving water uh, it's also to do with saving the gas you consume for cooking etc so it's, it's it's all linked to us also and how we uh, behave uh very well said ma'am i hope the viewers will be bringing about uh, change on a personal level as well uh, we have i'll be we'll take last question from shivani verma from sp vijayawada she is asking what according to you is the major sector that is contributing to the climate change so world over it's the energy sector and uh, uh, and the energy sector has five sources of emissions it's electricity production so thermal power plants Uh, uh, it's uh, industrial processes uh, uh, which are consuming electricity. It's transportation. Uh, uh, it's residential consumption of uh, electricity and commercial consumption of electricity. So these are the five main con uh, consumption, uh, you know, sources which are contributing to greenhouse gases. Uh, majorly in India, also it is contributing to seventy percent of the emissions. 70 percent plus of the emissions, and the second sector is agriculture and land use. Land use cover change. So world over also it's energy, and in India also it's energy. And in India we we are basically we normally say, and the government also says, we are a developing country. We are still growing. Not all our uh, you know all our regions are electrified. Our villages basically have one point source of electricity. We cannot say that we provided electricity to everyone. Uh, you know, quality electricity to everyone. So, if, you know, rural areas lack enough electricity uh, right now. So, we still have to reach out to them. So, that basically, we are saying that we will burn more fossil fuels. We will use more of those resources to be able to improve the quality of provision of these resources to our people, which we have not so far not done because we're still developing. That means we are emitting seventy percent from the energy sector. We are going to increase further emissions from the energy sector if we are going to expand. and we have to expand because we have to give quality services to our uh, to all our people but but can we expand in a way where we don't contribute to the emissions and look for greener sources of providing energy to those people and quality services to those people this is another area of work that one can look at and we have to look at those areas because we cannot use fossil fuels and our traditional ways of producing uh, energy to be able to to at the end of the day contribute to the emissions of greenhouse So, so these are the big areas of work that one needs to basically look at and get into. Ah, uh, very well said, ma'am. 
I hope uh, with time we'll have a paradigm shift in energy production and other such uh, uh, polluting sources that we have. Uh, I must thank you uh, for your session, uh, but I would request you for, for an ending note for the viewers. Specifically. So my ending note would be related to that question. I think each and every one of us should contribute in reducing our carbon footprints on Earth's surface. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, we also have our editor in chief with us uh, from the Executive Council. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Neva. Uh, actually, and, uh, like uh, the insights that we have uh, taken from this webinar, like, they have been uh, uh, very insightful, actually, and got done. Thanks. Uh, the practical Uh, thank you so much, Chaitanya. Uh, so, well, that's the end of our special lecture at Kunal uh, But stay tuned. We have so many competitions coming up, live streamed, being live streamed on different platforms. Pick two levels, all our uh, events are happening over there as well. Uh, so, thank you so much and stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you. Like, share, subscribe. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned for more.